Muy buenos días. Good Bienvenidos morning. al evento and welcome to the event Latin America and the Caribbean tackling the COVID-19 emergency in the new global context. Outlooks for integration, trade, and regional cooperation. For this conversation, we will have the IDB president, Luis Alberto Moreno, present, as well as four esteemed panelists, the former president of Chile, Ricardo Lagos, co-president of the Ibero-American Council for Competitiveness and Productivity and former IDB president Enrique Iglesias, the president of the um, Inter International Relations Council of Latin America and the Caribbean and former president of CAF, Enrique Garcia, and the president of Boeing Latin America, Donna Hernac. Our conversation will be in Spanish with interpretation into English. Please send your questions to Paul C at IADB.org. Go ahead, President Moreno. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege and an honor to be here for this conversation. We had thought about having this in Uruguay much before COVID happened, and the Latin American International Relations Council, that was an idea of President Lagos, who's with us today, and Enrique Garcia. It's very important to think of Latin America in the international context. We have much more to provide, but for some reason, we are never able to put topics on the table that we should as a region in this dialogue. We have the American business rep dialogue representative, as well as the Ibero-American Council for Productivity and Competitiveness. Enrique Garcia, president of Real and former president of CAF. We have Ricardo Lagos, who was president of Chile. Enrique Iglesias, my predecessor and my uh, guiding star here at the IDB. And Donna Reinach, who I knew when she was Under Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs, and she's had a distinguished career at the Department of State, as well as worked at the embassy in Brazil and now works in Latin America. So I appreciate their contribution, especially. Thank you for being here for this workshop. We would have preferred to see everyone in person, but the idea is that we are all at least connected via Zoom. We need to start by understanding that Latin America and the Caribbean were undergoing a very complex situation even before all of this. We had pre-existing conditions when it came to uh, politics and economics. There were trade tensions between the large powers, protectionist tendencies, and the multilateral system was being questioned. As we all know, Latin America already had volatile growth that was insufficient to allow it to improve inclusion, lower poverty, and increase inclusion the way we were able to do during the commodities boom. The integration of our economies, President Lagos invited us to an ECLAC forum not too long ago. We need to think about what to do so that Latin American integration is deeper. And to all of this, we need to add the current health and economic crisis. Even before the pandemic, as I said, we believed that growth would be about 1.5% this year and about 2.3% in 2021. Now all forecasts have been revised downward. We believe there may be a fall of up to five, minus 5.5 percent. The OCD, the World Bank, are now forecasting numbers that are even lower, down to 7 percent. And this has to do, obviously, with the impact of quarantines in a context where public resources are scarce, our countries are investing more in health so that hospitals are not overwhelmed. And it's probable that this spending will be financed be, by greater borrowing or exceptional mechanisms for 
temporary financing. All of this uh, presents a series of significant challenges to our countries. And as the IDB's macroeconomic report suggests, it talks about several ways of tackling the crisis. And I would highlight four points. Avoid an increase in costs due to the partial closure of our economies, support for banks, so helping businesses so that there's increased liquidity, help businesses so that work contracts are ongoing to avoid unemployment in as much as possible, and assisting the poorest among us. Regional integration in this context in Latin America has also been affected international trade has dropped to levels never seen before. The drop in global demand has reduced the exports of our countries. Uh, as President Lagos always says, small economies can only grow when it, there is significant international trade. And all of this is occurring in a situation where we see increasing protectionist tendencies or trends. This is the current situation. And so I would like to start with President Lagos and have him talk to us a bit about the pre-existing conditions such as social unrest, what we saw in Chile, Colombia, and what is our country's capacity right now, Mr. President, to respond to these challenges? Well, thank you very much for this invitation. I think that the that President Moreno has given a very clear description about the current state of affairs. We thought that this meeting was going to be more optimistic, but now we are facing a much more complex situation. Why? Because there has been discontent in the middle class. Uh, the golden era we had, the export boom, we thought that we were making the most of that and that we were getting ahead. The protests took us by surprise in the sense that citizens were unhappy with what was happening. They saw that there was growth, but the benefits did not reach them. And if they did, they were very low. It was not inclusive enough. What has happened due to the pandemic? This pandemic has made this situation more serious. It has shown the dramatic situation for those who have been left without jobs and we wonder what to do about it. So this is the current context. The pandemic is one issue that has created greater dissatisfaction even after the protests we had previously seen in our countries. So now we have protests that have not continued due to the pandemic, but it doesn't mean that the issues that led to these protests have disappeared. What is happening now then due to the pandemic is it is shining a light on our previous situation. I would say that this pandemic actually has shown a light on things in such a way that an institution such as Bloomberg, which rates countries, has conducted a very crude analysis and has said what's going on here is that you have the governing elites, you have the business sector, elites in business and government, and so on, and they have not listened to what is actually going on. So this is a serious challenge that we have in front of us. And we have the pandemic with the light being shown on our current difficulties. And the question then is, given that everything is being highlighted, giving, given what we're going through, we had a health minister who stepped down and he said at one point that he had no idea about the level of overcrowding that existed in some areas of Santiago. This was such a frank statement from the minister, and I won't even tell you how it was received, but the truth is that this reflects the current state of affairs. So the question now is what comes next? Will we be able to connect with 
the high levels of discontent in society, can we start to implement the necessary measures? And I think that here we can perhaps overstate things and say, well, we've always said that crises are actually opportunities, but what would be the opportunity for us today? The opportunity today is that once we are able to resolve the issues in the health sector, which some countries have done well already in Latin America, some have been textbooks example, textbook examples such as Uruguay. Once we are able to fix the problems in our health system, what we'll have in front of us is the challenge as to how to recover economic growth, how to restart how to double our efforts because the president of our central bank stated that we were going to move back 20 years, 20 years, and therefore we have to recover that time. And that is a huge challenge. So what I think we are facing, what we have ahead of us as far as an opportunity is that there will be large-scale investments. In my country, there is still room for borrowing, and therefore, we will borrow significantly. But those significant, significant borrowings then mean that we will have to define what kind of investments we want to make. And I think that this is the crux of the matter, because we will need investments that are different from the investments that existed before the crisis and before the pandemic. So in other words, we are able to say, let's invest, make investments that pass the test, for example, for development in Latin America or worldwide towards what the UN calls the 2030 challenge. What do we want growth to look like by 2030. We want it to be inclusive. We want it to be sustainable over time. We want this growth to be, etc., etc. This growth may be the sieve that we use to triage all of our development projects. And if so, then I would comment even further. If all of our countries are going to face investing so that we may recover a level of economic growth. We could agree that in order for these investments to occur, they need to be aligned with definitions for the strategy defined for development by 2030. Because if we do agree that what we all define together is a factor, then it would be possible starting now, regardless of our ideological patterns that are very different in the region's governments, meaning our growth is going to have to recover. For this growth, then, we want clarity when it comes to what kinds of investments we're going to make. Do these investments line up with the 2030 challenge? If we do so, then I think that in Latin America, we will find a way to tackle this pandemic from a health perspective. We hope that it is left behind us so that we can then concentrate on what is to come. What will our strategy for growth be? What will our levels of investment be? I think that in this regard, we have a lot to learn from each other. So just to wrap up this introduction, Mr. President, and hearing what the President had to say, would it be possible to have at the bank some workshop on these topics on how to define a manual for making these investments? Why am I asking? I have a very long-standing relationship with the bank. I was Felipe Herrera's student, and then I obtained a doctorate in the U.S. when Dr. Herrera was in charge of the IDB. I remember having been at his house talking about these very issues. And this is perhaps not right to say, but I learned then how important it was to have a bank for Latin America. 
And how did we come to this? I asked him because he was involved in this from the start. And I learned then that the bank would be in Washington because that is where, that was where at the time the international agencies resided, such as the IMF and the World Bank after Bretton Woods. And I learned then about an inter-American bank and there were also other regional banks. That is why the current situation is a bit uncomfortable because there was a certain understanding and we'd like to think that regardless of elections that will be held at the bank, we should have a bank that has its sights set on Latin America. And in that regard, I believe that we must persevere and continue to build upon what's been built in the last 60 years from 1960 to date for IDB presidents it speaks well of Latin America, long-term presidents that have been able to develop a vision. And you, Mr. President, are wrapping up your term with the same brilliance of your three predecessors. I think that this is what we would like to preserve looking forward. And I think that it would be good to have a workshop on what kinds, just a couple of final points to conclude, what kinds of investments, if we want to build social housing, social housing currently, just as there's space for a kitchen, two meters by two meters, perhaps a space for a computer workstation so that people can connect to the world for telework. That would then become a requirement. Would it become a requirement for housing in the future? So right now, this is an opportunity for us to talk about these things over Zoom. Secondly, we could also imagine that we would have new sources of energy, such as nitrogen, perhaps. Nitrogen presents another challenge. So in other words, would it be able to have fiber optics for the last mile, understanding that this is a part of infrastructure that's as important as a road or a highway? In some, I think that the types of investments made will be different and we may take a big step forward if we have a forum where we can debate these issues. Just some final reflections. This crisis is gigantic. It's much broader than the crisis of 2008 and only comparable to the crisis of 1929 and 1930. In 2008, what we were going to discuss was clear. President Bush had the clarity to say, we need G20, no longer a G7. The question now is, where do we discuss this crisis? And I think, as you expressed very well, right now we are facing an international situation where the world that was built for governance is leaving much to be desired regarding the type of governance we might have in the future. I think then perhaps that a modest seminar might help us discuss these issues for a more integrated Latin America, at least when it comes to the rebuilding of our countries after this crisis. Those are my words of introduction, Mr. President. Thank you, President Lagos. Your comments are very wise as usual. This reminds me of the time after the Great Depression and Roosevelt's New Deal. In Latin America, there were all kinds of ideas wanting to do something different. In the US, Roosevelt was accused of being a traitor to his own class because he did something that was deep rooted when it came to the need to understand the huge amounts of unemployment and poverty that required this kind of action in society. And I think this is the big question that we need to ask in Latin America. Our history after the Great Depression was not good because as you know, many military governments rose to power and we did not have the institutions and multilateralism that began to develop as a result of that. So I wanted to discuss that topic precisely with Enrique Iglesias, who has dedicated his life to, his life to multilateralism and to international cooperation. Currently, 
lately, there's a bit of fatigue regarding multilateralism. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Germany and President Macron have wanted to start a conversation about what multilateralism should look like in the future. And that is a good question that President Lagos has asked, where are we all going? And how can we find ways to cooperate on a continent like ours that depends on so many things? And especially, we need strong multilateralism, as this is what has protected Latin America to a great extent. Enrique, thank you much, Mr. President. Thank you for having me here to share a few ideas about what concerns us so greatly right now. Your question about multilateralism, I think that this is fundamental because this is what shows that things are changing worldwide. We are entering uncharted territory and it's dangerous. This is what's currently occurring. I believe that after World War II in 1945, there was a long period that lasted about 80 years where the concept of multilateralism dominated. People understood that building a peaceful world needed to be undertaken by everyone and that all countries needed to be involved in that dialogue, some to a greater or lesser extent. But we were united by the concept of keeping peace based on consensus and collective action. These 75 years, I believe, were the most fruitful 75 years in the history of humankind, in the history of humankind. Production, or the population tripled, but production multiplied by 12. The poverty rate worldwide was 40%. We had complementary factors, which were also extremely impactful. Life expectancy in the Christian era during the time of Jesus Christ was 30 years. 2,000 years later, 1945, it went up to 45 years. Now it's at 75 years. So life expectancy that uh, it took 2,000 years to grow by 15 years, and in the last 70 years, it grew by 40 more. There have been issues, of course. For example, we have not had an atomic war. There have been so many people who have died for many reasons, race, religion, and nationalism. These things have always divided us, and unfortunately, they continue to do so. This has led to a crisis due to many reasons, due to our own defects. Inequality is an issue, and currently the middle class has opened its eyes to this in many parts of the world, but we have not been able to resolve inequality as of yet. There are other problems that we see. For example, we are more conscious of the fact that there is a climate that we need to defend. We are starting to see a significant change. This is a process. And we're seeing that two large powers, such as the US and China, that have had a fundamental disagreement on fundamental issues such as trade, but also values these countries' presence in the world. So these, this huge issue has led to a crisis that we were dealing with now, and there is a period of change. Multilateralism led to great benefits, which is how we had this 75-year time period. I think democracy is much stronger now than ever before. There is more dialogue and especially communication. Last year, 1.5 billion people crossed borders, 20% of the population moved. So just it, we need to understand these phenomena, truly. 
this is leading to discontent and there are gaps that are widening between the two great powers with trade technology and I hope it does not advance farther than that. But I wanted to explain that that is the current situation we are concerned because there is a current huge transformation in the history of humankind. Latin America, even though there are different political systems, this continent always was supportive of the conference that created the UN in 1945 by 51 countries. We Now we have 190. The situation has changed quite a bit, but I think that in any case, this was a commitment of great men in each one of our countries. They turned this into a central objective. But international integration was supported by the UN, by great figures. Trade was very much influenced. ECLAC was what pushed this forward. We have the World Trade Organization's conferences of countries during the crisis of the 70s. So Latin America was an institutional builder of the world that we have left behind. And now we face another world with different challenges. I think that for us in Latin America, we need to be aware of the fact, unfortunately, and this must be said honestly, I truly don't remember a time with such little regional unity and a will to do things together. And I've been at this for quite a while. So this makes me feel very concerned. We need to not reside in the past. We need to be here. We need to be present. We need to be willing to build and provide support. Trade has been one of these areas, but there are many others in the multilateral system. We, there was a strong presence from the UN of Latin America in the United Nations to such an extent that today we see danger on the horizon, significant danger. And I hope that these are manageable when we talk about trade or technology, which is another important front. The presence of different powers in different areas of the world, if all of this is, all of this is in danger. And I believe that Latin America needs to have a stronger presence than it currently does. And therefore, there must be first an internal agreement. And that is what I feel right now, sincerely, that we are lacking. That's why we are somewhat absent when it comes to defending the order that gave us so much. And that we, the benefits of which we were currently enjoying. Thank you, Enrique. Enrique Garcia was talking to us about a central issue that is going to be a part of the solution of everything going forward, which is this digital rev revolution. So my question is, will it be possible to achieve this digital change that we have seen has impacted productivity, especially when we see telework. Can this become compatible with the other objectives to change major systems that uh, allow us, such as in education and health, to achieve greater social inclusion, equity, and more open society? Because it is true that COVID is arrived surprisingly but climate change has been knocking on the door for many years. So can you talk about this, Enrique? Thank you very much, Luis Alberto. Let me begin saying that it's a real pleasure to hold this virtual meeting. Originally, it had been planned to take place in Montevideo with our great friends, and I'm so glad to see you, Ricardo, Enrique, and Donna. It's really a pleasure to include you all in the group. I share fully everything else that uh, you have all said up to now as to where we stand. The question, however, is this pandemic, which is the strongest scourge for Latin America, let me point out that unfortunately our region, which you may recall in the 60s, 
was the developing region with greater prosperity in the world, the region with greater prospects. Now, unfortunately, we have lost that relative importance. And there's yet another detail. The millennium that began with a spectacular boom when it came to commodities, prices, lots of factors that were functioning well. We had agreements between Mexico and North America. At that period in history, Latin Americans felt that they were really conquering and being triumphant, that we were touching the sky. And we didn't really take advantage of this bonanza to have some deep structural changes, taking us from a comparative advantage situation highly tied to commodity prices, first of all, especially for South America, to lead us to a dynamic advantage situation of advantage conditions, allowing us to be inserted in yet a different reality. And this is something that we didn't felt in the first decade of this millennium. And I'm talking about the fourth industrial revolution, which has truly taken off, especially since 2012. But that is the reality. We fell in what is called the trap of middle income countries. And to respond to your question, Luis Alberto, I believe that this issue of being inserted, included in the future, with the incredible advances of this new industrial revolution takes us precisely to the topic of digitization. And this is a major challenge. We have made advances, yes, but they've been very little. If we compare to what we hear about internet, blockchain, digitization in all areas of activity, and if we compare ourselves with some other countries, then we see that Latin America is truly lagging. We're behind. Now, the question is, this change, this situation that has been so well described, the economic nature, geopolitics, and on the other hand, the human impact, which is the most serious, the fact that people who have no longer a job, that the indices of Latin American equity that unfortunately were already the worst in the world, we had the worst devil compared to other regions. So now, in this phase, can we tie this with the objectives that, as Ricardo pointed out, broaden the spectrum of the 2030 goals? Recently, I have been advocating that it is crucial that we focus on achieving a model, that we change or renew the existing model, but have a holistic, integral vision, making both objectives compatible, because they are necessary in order to regain the macroeconomic equilibrium. We are currently faced with a situation that means that we need to increase our fiscal deficits, increasing our debt, and that's what needs to be done for the pandemic in the short term. But that will not be sustainable in the long term. The second issue is efficiency, especially in productivity, in order to achieve growth compatible, compatible with the world's new technological realities. And third, and this is a factor that we often neglect, it needs to be compatible with equity. How can we achieve a society that feels that is, has been isolated, that is, is not achieving all the benefits. So we need to find that. And fourthly, we need a balance with the environment. This is holistic, but to achieve it, what do we need? We need a consistency, and this brings into play the political aspect. Do the countries truly have an integral vision? I'm afraid not. There's a divorce. The ministers of finance and economy sit down and happily talk about fiscal deficit, external debt, etc. But they don't tackle the other topics. People in the environment talk about environment, but in isolation. Those who are in health also in isolation. We need to have an integral vision. And this uh, brings 
in another topic that is so important, as Enrique pointed out, regional integration. This was a dream, a fantastic dream for Latin America, with important advances adjusting to the new eras. And that led us to some very interesting agreements. And I recall Ricardo, when you, he was president of Chile, an understanding was reached between what at that time was the Andean community and Mercosur, and this resulted in South American unity. And then, for reasons that were more than anything else political and ideological, broke down. And today we are seeing a fragmentation. New organizations are created continuously, but they're not really achieving that integration. So now we have a challenge under the new situation. In essence, the global chains of trade have been broken down by the pandemic. There is a trend to focus inward. Is this going to last? We don't know. What is important, though, is that the process to build digital platforms in all ambits of our Latin American countries work, this has a lot to do with the production processes, it has to do with supplies, logistics, infrastructure, it has to do with health, it has to do with education, tele-education also, and necessarily it encompasses all activities and politics. Part of the situation pointed out by President Lagos is the dissatisfaction of our society. And that conversation is not through the traditional political interlocutor, which is the, poli the political parties or the parliament. Instead, it turns to these instruments, the iPhone, the iPhone that can very rapidly convene people and social networks are having either a positive or negative influence on people through this means. So the, in this context, what we have to do is start working as Latin Americans. Let us truly try and retake a process of cooperation that is realistic, pragmatic, and uh, appropriate for the circumstances. The principle for Latin American unity, taking advantage of the circumstances, create value chains, supply chains, beginning internally in the countries, then regionally, and then with the right conditions, it can be scaled up. That is really the key. And I'd like to share with you the importance of multilaterals. Since I was practically born, I've been involved with multilaterals. I began with Felipe Herrera, I worked with Antonio and Enrique, and obviously more recently with Luis Alberto. We have worked for all these years that I have been at CAF. So I think it's a crucial moment to rethink our values, to maintain the principles of political agreements reached in the past, which as Ricardo and Enrique pointed out, they created the Inter-American Development Bank in 1959, and it began to operate in 1960. So let me stop there for now. Thank you very much, Enrique. Let me now give the floor to Donna Hreinach, we have spoken a lot about the transformations that are required. There is no doubt that one of the major transformations will have to occur through the private sector. There was a survey carried out by the magazine Fortune, surveying the presidents of the largest companies in the world. And what you see in this survey is, first of all, they didn't really see a major increase in jobs. They didn't think that we'd come out of this crisis till at least 20 months had elapsed. And there is great doubt as to how to direct investment and in what direction. So Donna, how do you see the econ global economy and trade, especially in the post-COVID era? Thank you very much, President. Let me, first of all, thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. These truly noteworthy people of the hemisphere, highly admired individuals, and they are not old friends. 
but uh, let me just put it in another term, spent for many years. It is truly also an honor to participate as in my capacity of being the only woman and in Latin American in the, my, the deep of my heart. We have heard broad perspectives about the challenges our region is facing and also some well thought through ideas about next steps. I'd like to focus particularly on my sector, the sector of commercial aviation, as an example of a sector that may become a strong engine for economic recovery in our region as well as in the world, and what we need to do to ensure this happens. First, commercial aviation could become a motor because for many years it has contributed strongly to the countries in our region. And regardless of a country's size and sophistication of its economy, in Brazil, according to IATA statistics, this is the International Association of uh, Transportation, Commercial transport supports a large number of works and contributes $18.8 billion, which is a contribution of 1.1% of the GDP. On the other hand, a smaller economy, the Dominican Republic, this industry contributes $9 billion annually. That is 12.5% of uh, the national product, BNP. Even in the United States, it's an industry making 9.3 jobs available and 4% to the national GNP. This includes trade flows, investments, tourism, and they're all tied to air transportation. So it's not only the sector's survival, but its sustainability in the difficult years has deep implications for the health and recovery of our economy. The good news in all this is that the sector has always been highly resistant in the past 50 years during wars and other pandemics, economic crises, the industry always recovered rapidly and becoming even stronger than prior to the event. But there is also bad news, and this I believe is news that affects all the, the entire private sector, and that is that this COVID crisis is a truly global crisis. There is not a single region that has escaped it. Other crises, such as the war, they may have impacted the Middle East more, the SARS pandemic had an impact in Asia. In this case, no region has been spared and is not able to offset the fall and drops in others. It's a global pandemic. Likewise, in our sector, income, has been affected stronger than in other crises. After 9-11, there was a 20% drop in income. With the SARS pandemic, it was a 12% drop. This time, an incredibly in income for commercial aviation that brings us together for trade, tourism, families, culture, the drop has been 95% compared to last year. And that is because the government interventions are so important and why the collaboration of all so sectors of society. Many governments in our region recognize how essential this industry is and they have authorized greater flexibility in some operations for this sector. Airports, for instance, ground operations have shown great flexibility when it comes to relationships between operators of airports and airlines. 
and also been financial support, including the uh, waiving of certain taxes that uh, are paid by airlines. Some of these decisions haven't yet culminated, but they are in process. But the key to restore the sector and the key so that it may become the motor for the recovery of global economy is trust. Trust, allowing passengers to want to get, feel comfortable traveling, whether it be for business or for tourism or to make investments that will be so important in the region. And in order to build this trust, we need to think both of technology and possibilities of developing such technologies in the region and economy. So it's technologies in cleaning of aircraft, technologies to create materials that are resistant not only to coronavirus, but to all the contaminants and organisms, but also education. The passengers need to feel and know that the air inside an aircraft is cleaner, healthier than air in other environments, that the filters used in aircraft is the same as the, the filters used in hospitals. I would like to conclude thinking about the broader perspectives presented by my colleague. Next year, at the next, we're going to have the Summit of the Americas. IDB has an important role to play in the summit, likewise the chambers of commerce, the private sector, the governments of the region. Since my time in the government of the United States, I used to be, I was the coordinator of an earlier summit, and we committed to a very broad agenda for regional integration, not only in Latin America, but throughout the hemisphere, beginning with Canada. This, I believe, this next year would be an opportunity to renew those commitments, to have a forum where we can talk about the agenda in detail for the agenda for 2020 to 2030. Thank you very much, President. Thank you, Donna. We have many questions that have been sent in by the audience, but I would like to ask President Lago something that Donna mentioned. And this is a topic to which you have devoted a lot of time when talking about integration in the region. If we look at the value chains, the major factors in the world are on the axis between Korea, China, Japan, where about 40% of industry is located. And the rest is North America and Europe have with a 17, 18%, and then the rest of the world. So the question is, Obviously, there's going to be a change to the value change. The question is, how we, can we do this smartly in Latin America? For instance, should we do it with a smart uh, substitution and replacement of imports? If we look at all the Latin American surveys, everyone, at least on the majority, want greater integration in the region. But we face all the problems that you have spent years addressing. So as a consequence of COVID, how do you believe we can move forward to create what I have said, instead of saying made in America, it should be made in the America. So how can we turn that dream that we've always had, how can we turn it into reality, President Lagos? President, please unmute your microphone. Mute. You're still muted, President Lagos. Your microphone is muted. Uh, now we can hear you. 
I had been muted by someone. This is a very direct and very specific question. I fear that either we can initiate some common projects in the new emerging economy amongst countries. And if we are not able to do this, we are going to be competing amongst ourselves to see who offers greater facilities to attract foreign investment to our countries. Let me give an example, and I haven't really talked this over with anyone, but it comes to mind as I look at the reality. Lithium is suddenly the fashionable metal. We all agree that it's extremely important. We also all know that there is lithium in Bolivia. There is lithium in Argentina. There is lithium not as much, but also in Chile. Is it possible to think about an agreement on lithium between these three countries? Realizing we have this commodity, we should see how, first, at the level of a, our government, we can take a common look at how to take advantage of this. It requires research and not only financial resources, but it also means that we need to take a look at what other countries are doing throughout the world. Are we, these three countries, able to get together to talk about lithium? That is the kind of thing that I believe we ought to be capable of doing, because otherwise we're going to end up competing who can pay the lowest salary in order to be able to have lower prices, or what tax benefits are you going to give me? We need to take a leap in this direction. It is essential. Let me give you an example of real life. I've been told that next year, for the first time, there is going to be one of these large, large, large mining actions that is going to be hydrogen propulsed. This is in an abandoned mine in Chile where experiments are being carried out. This would then be followed because these large mining trucks where the wheels are as large as a human being spend 1,000 to 1,500 liters of diesel a day. If that diesel that needs to be transported, taken to the mine, etc., if you're able to transform it, and if the mine is in the northern part of Chile where the solar radiation is the most important of the world, you could generate hydrogen next to the truck that needs to be loaded with that hydrogen, that needs to be fueled with it. So then you have different characteristics. These are realities that are under consideration. How many of these realities exist that we could grasp? The private enterprise do it. There are three companies looking into it right now because they realize how valuable it is. Once you have green copper, that copper is no longer a commodity and then has a different price. Ah, that's novel for a country like Chile that is, has so much copper. And if that green copper, once it has the stamp on, when you recycle it, well, the aluminum is recycled at 98% and can be reused as aluminum. The copper, the copper is sold cheaply once you've used it. So the 80 kilograms in a car, such as Tesla, most cars have 40 kilograms, but Tesla's cars have more copper. And this is waste. It is just thrown away. What happened if that green copper can be fully integrated? It's not very good because uh, copper has many, many uses or many reuses. But from the standpoint of climate change, it is extremely important. So are we able to generate, using these examples, can countries add value amongst ourselves working together? This would therefore be a specific way forward. And 
here is where we need help from an entity such as the Inter-American Development Bank and other similar entities, because ultimately it is a matter of generating value chains amongst countries to do it on a cooperative basis and not fighting and trying to generate the best conditions to attract of the outside investment to our country. These are the kind of topics that we need to look into. These are new investments in ambits that are unknown to us, but there is still a lot to be done to bring it down. My last question would be, how can we today, for example, move forward in other ambits, these being based on learning what are we going to do about equality or inequality? How can we have new tax systems? What we have seen, and this takes me back to the earlier question, question is that digital networks is a reality that already exists, but the networks also need to be listened to. And there is a debate, which are the political institutions that without forgetting that democracy is a representative reality, by, by very definition, representatives are elected, but it also needs to be a democracy that is heard. So the question is, what political institutions are going to exist that learn to listen to citizenry? Frequently, people are going to look at Uruguay. Did you know that in Uruguay, Citizens can derogate a law approved by the Congress if a number of people want to eliminate that law because it is a popular decision. But that law does have a requirement. Those that vote to eliminate the law has to be a larger number of citizens than, than those that elected the parliamentarians. So it's not just a, a matter of having a appetite. No, there are rules to be followed, but there are ways you can learn to listen. And therefore, there are ways of doing it. I think these issues are extremely important for what is on the horizon. We all know the very positive role or very negative role played by social media. So we need to adopt measures in this context. We need to be more holistic. And this is another area where Latin American countries can try to move forward by joining efforts. So in summary, I think that integration processes among us can be within reach. Obviously, it was easier to bring together Mercosur with the Pacific Alliance at the time. But today, perhaps we can seek different ways to achieve integration that overcome the political differences. And let me here share some sincere ideas. For Latin America to exist, it must always include Mexico and Brazil. And in Mexico and Brazil, they're a little bit on the other side of matters because of the kind of government they have. So how can we find common ground, allowing us to move forward in a different manner in a process for integration? Uh, this crisis and how we pull out of it, I believe it will generate specific areas where we can think of some common ground. If we are to do this, I think we will achieve a lot of progress. This takes me back to my theory of Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile, and lithium. That would be an example for the rest of the region. Countries that sometimes, because we are so close, have all these problems. So let me stop there. Thank you, Mr. President. I remembered that initiative with uh, mining value, and it is surprising when it comes to Chile and Peru, they have about 40% of copper production worldwide. But what you put forward that we worked on a lot at the IDB, and unfortunately, sometimes there are obvious things that we didn't work on enough, is that the entire surroundings and the ecosystem of the mining industry from tires to engines, all of these 
related services could be produced just when it comes to Chile, Peru, and probably other countries as well. An industry not only for our own countries, but for the rest of the world and the mining industry in general. So these are the kinds of things that we are going to very seriously have to think about. And that forum you discussed will invite you because we're putting it together around issues such as the, what should be the new social contract. And I think that this needs to be the big agenda in Latin America going forward. And we're going to all have to learn about it, about how to design this more intelligently. I have so many questions here. One of them I'd like to pass to Enrique Iglesias. Are you concerned that authoritarianism, the resurgence of it in the region uh, means that uh, what this means for military coups, Enrique. You need to unmute yourself, Enrique. We hear you now. Of course, we are all concerned about ma maintaining our democratic institutions because it was so difficult to establish them all over Latin America. I, know, I do not want to see, again, the terrible periods. I saw, that, I saw in this region in many of our countries, I believe that people are aware of this, but I think that the times during which one sees large social unbalances, protests, or a loss of income or wealth, all of this unfortunately encourages people to start disbelieving democracy in Latin America. This is very clear. There is a metric showing that democracy has lost support and this unfortunately might encourage adventures in authoritarianism. I think that what we need to do then is respond with a more efficient democracy and if the way to put a barrier between us and that situation we need a dem democracy that works. We need sound macroeconomic policies, integration pro processes, and partnerships between society, business, and the government. We need a way to hold democracy up and strengthen it with these inputs that help people believe in it. If this doesn't happen, then these risks continue to exist. And I think this would be a historic step back that I would not like to see. Again, thank you. Thank you, Enrique Garcia. We have several questions for you, and many of them have to do with technology. The basic question is this, countries and everyone needed to telework, it was forced telework, but there are many differences in the region. In some capitals, there's good broadband, but in some areas right next to the capitals, the quality of the internet is so the question is, do you think that countries will invest more in this once the most drastic effects of the pandemic have passed? Well, the fact that this pandemic has given us a clear signal that everything we're doing, say this event, for example, normally if it were held in Montevideo, we might have had 80 people in attendance but apparently I think 1,000 registered and we have 600 people online. So that's what we're going, that's what's going to happen in healthcare and education. But the key question is not everyone in society has access to the internet. Poor, poor people do not have this access. So I think that an important lesson for governments and when it comes to international cooperation, what we're going to have to do is create the mechanisms necessary in order to broaden these platforms and make them available to greater sectors of society. I think that is crucial. I think that there come uh, an important point in time lies ahead of us. Uh, there's a phrase used by someone in the World Economic Forum. We're talking about the great global reset, meaning that this is the time for a global reset. We need to basically rethink everything in order to make everything compatible. New technologies, make them compatible with 
goals, not only as relate to productivity and growth, but also environmental sustainability and equity. Jeffrey Stutz used to say, and this was very well thought out, that a weakness that we need to tackle is precisely education. Education for the 21st century, which is not based on what has been traditional, but rather abilities, because with digitization and technology, a large number of traditional jobs are going to disappear. So we need new practices and techniques, and this requires training human resources in non-traditional areas, not only in high school and the university, but in continuing education when you visit Asian countries such as Singapore, China, Korea, even Vietnam, you'll see training human resources using a modern approach. So that is what I would have to say in that regard. Thank you, Enrique. Donna, speaking of aviation, and you gave us some clear examples for Latin America. I remember seeing outlooks saying that in the next 15 years, Latin America would need about 3,000 new airplanes. We saw large numbers of cases of people who had never previously been on an airplane, but they started to travel due to low cost airplanes. Now what we're seeing, however, is that there are two clear lines in or airlines that have filed for chapter 11. So what will happen to airlines in Latin America? They are fundamental to our integration. So how is that moving ahead? This Latin America isn't the only case we're seeing this everywhere, but undoubtedly in Latin America, we had built a series of world-class airlines that allowed us to connect to each other. Donna. Yes, this was going to be a very important year for the delivery of new aircraft to Latin American Airlines. And obviously, we'll see a very different situation compared to what we had foreseen a year ago. Some of these clients, these airlines are good customers of Boeing's, obviously. So this is a situation that we would like to correct as soon as possible and it requires the assistance not only of ourselves within the sector but it also requires the help of the sectors that have been affected due to the decline in the industry so we need the assistance of hotel associations travel agency groups chambers of commerce and obviously governments. The situation, as you said, Mr. President, has affected many sectors and no single sector can operate in an isolated fashion in their own section of the economy. Last year, we were involved in a conversation about an aerospace event that should take place in our hemisphere next year. And the organizers are implementing very serious measures to ensure the health of those who plan to attend. The problem is that people need to travel to this fair. They need to travel by airplane. They need to eat in restaurants, stay at hotels. They need to take public transportation to get to the event. So that means that we need to have a society-wide effort so that we can satisfy the needs of passengers, of business people, of tourists who would like to once again travel by airplane. Since we are talking about the role of cooperation between the private sector and governments, I'd like to say that there are one important thing be for governments to reaffirm their commitment to economic measures. And obviously we need extraordinary measures or special measures now, but these special measures cannot distort the progress that had been made in economies, not only when it comes to macro 
reform at the macro level, but also reform at the micro level that was already in progress. These reforms will be greatly helpful to us as we try to deal with the huge issues with inequity that we face. And I'd like to mention uh, to Enrique Garcia that this includes, as he said, investing in health and in education. My great concern as regards this pandemic is that when it, when it comes to civil aviation and education or any other sector that is being affected, my concern is that we're not going to learn a thing, that we are going to repeat the same mistakes and we face such huge challenges, different challenges such as climate change. So we need to use this time as a unique moment in our history. For example, for my parents' generation, their big moment was World War II, and they responded by being the, they were the great generation. This is a challenge for our generation. So how are we going to respond? Are we going to make the same mistakes? Are we going to waste this opportunity? Or as leaders in the region, rather, are we going to make the changes that need to be made? Leadership, there's nothing more important than leadership in the region right now. And this includes my country. Thank you, Donna. This is a question for President Lagos. And the question, is on corruption. With such enormous public investment that will have to be made by governments in the upcoming years, how do you think states should intervene in order to resolve this situation, which will be crucial in implementing these measures? Well, I think that that might be one of the most complex issues we're going to have to deal with because corruption encompasses practically every area of society. So how to establish the levels of transparency needed in order to regain credibility? Corruption isn't simply a matter of conspiring and buying off a public official. What levels of transparency do we have in the public and the private sector? And how able are we to get ahead of the facts or of events? And so I think here what we need is an autonomous, independent agency, independent from the executive, the legislative branch, and even the judicial branch. How can we include an ethical component in transparency? I think here we need to establish what the standards will be and who will be in charge of doing this because transparency when it comes to public bidding or international procurement or the issue of competition among two or three businesses or corruption in two or three companies. And we have taken steps forward and backwards as well. What to do in the case of whistleblowers or those who but were, who were a part of the corruption. Are they exempt from having committed that sin or are whistleblowers put in, in jail? And if they are, well, then no one will say anything. So these are things that are easy to come up with on paper, but in the real world, things are infinitely more complex than that. And I think that there's another important issue here, which has to do with the international system itself, because money laundering has advanced tremendously because now there is greater integration in our international banking system. And there is still more progress that needs to be made. Um, tax havens, which currently exist, many strides have been made, but they continue to exist. Now, corruption and drug trafficking is another issue. And that is perhaps one of the most difficult issues to tackle. There's an open financial system and precisely because of that we ran into the fact that the Chilean system was being used as a mechanism to move money to different places. So what we thought was something appropriate, one of the broadest systems possible, 
in terms of finances ended up being something that attracted the drug traffickers for money laundering purposes. So this means that in this area, we need to have global governance to a very large degree because this because global government governance is what will allow us to determine what the most important elements in play are. Right now, if a transfer is possible, if it can go from A to B without explaining what the funds are that are going from A to B, or for what reason. In other words, I think that these issues are issues for global global governance, and that brings us back to the beginning of our conversation. What has transpired in the last 70 years from the governance that was established after World War II with the creation of the United Nations? And as Enrique said, he mentioned 19 to 51 countries and our global governance currently, which the steps back taken in the last few years have been significant. And given this great setback when it comes to global governance and corruption, which is a transnational issue, it's one thing to combat this within the country and then cross-border issues are something completely different. So here we are missing certain elements. For example, issues that uh, an increasingly globalized world faces, but there are increasingly fewer global institutions that can put that governance into play. So this is a major challenge. Which are the major global topics? Climate change, needs for sustainability, needs to combat drug trafficking, the need to combat other elements of a global nature that no single country can resolve on its own. And the other side of this sentence is without the participation of some large countries, they cannot be resolved. So those large countries also need to be involved in this global governance. It's a very complex topic, there's no doubt about it, because corruption is transnational problem increased by globalization. So one thing is to combat corruption or the corruption within our societies, but then it's quite a different matter when it's the corruption between societies. So this is a typical case of indispensable global governance. Consequently, on the one hand, we've got what a, one specific country can do, and that country can do it right or wrong, but the country needs to also be inserted in a more global vision. To put that in simple terms, which are the overarching topics that today need to be resolved globally? And we can point out which they are, it's this, that, and the other. Well, what are we going to talk about this? Before we used to say international security issues, the Security Council, but now for a long time, the Security Council is the, no longer the leading actor, so it's addressed elsewhere. In economic topics, it became the G20 that uh, emerged on the side of how we were viewing it historically. In summary, the issue of corruption is a matter that needs to be inserted on the global agenda. Now, the question is where on that international agenda do we list corruption and where will it be discussed? Because countries individually can do a lot, but it will never be sufficient. Thank you very much, President. Enrique Iglesias, as everyone knows, was a foreign minister in Uruguay during the very famous Uruguayan round that gave rise to what became the seed for the creation of the World Trade Organization. Now, the WTO is facing a crisis similar to multilateralism. So what can you tell us about the future of WTO? 
Enrique, one of the fascinating aspects of these Zoom meetings is that at some point they end. In nine minutes, we will all be disconnected. So we bear that in mind, please. Thank you very much, Luis Alberto. The creation of the World Trade Organization is a discussion actually that began in 1947. All that multilateral structure came about when the Security Council, the Assembly, the World Bank, uh, the IMF, all of that was created. But the, the trade aspect failed because it's such a complex issue that they couldn't reach agreement. International competition is a very delicate issue. So it took place between 1947 and 1985. Uruguay at the time held the chair of the GATT round to create a World Trade Organization. Many factors helped. One of them was the fact that Dunkel, the GATS uh, president, was deeply committed to this, and another Uruguayan ambassador also played a very important role. An agreement was reached, and it was fundamental. It began with a round that took nine years, and this culminated in Marrakesh nine years later. That is where we saw the advantages of having a multilateral trade setup with many guarantees, guarantees uh, having to do with so many different topics in order to be able to ensure everybody respected the agreed rules and regulations. Today it's in danger, it's in jeopardy because there is a regreening of protectionism, not only because of protecting markets, but also seeing the failures in the system that need to be improved. We shouldn't be crying over spilled milk. We need to look at the future. We need to modernize the WTO to take into account the new world realities, the new problems, for instance, deriving from competition in using technologies or the energy uses or the new financial problems and topics. There's a whole slew of problems that needs to be brought on board. We've got the technological changes, the new types of competition. That is the big challenge ahead of us. I believe and hope that the world will discover that it was the, the World Trade Organization was a tremendous factor that promoted growth. There are problems, with, but let us not forget what was done, and then let's modernize the instrument and be able to maintain this growth. So that would be a very brief answer. I am concerned, but feel hopeful that uh, everyone will agree that it's worthwhile updating and modernizing the organization in order to support growth and social development and economic development. Thank you, Enrique. Let me give the last floor, the last word to Enrique Garcia. I recall a meeting that I had with Pope Francis who said that at this time, you either listen to the wise old people or listen to the youth because the youth are going to have to develop all of these changes. So what would you tell youth today, Enrique? I have a question here actually from Mexico, from Manuel Cruz asking, how can young people be integrated in the reconstruction of Latin America, both socially, economically, and politically? Well, quite obviously, I believe this is a new phase. New phase means we need to coexist and incorporate the new generations. We, at this event, we have a track record, but how can we make them become interested? Because in addition to all these changes that are tied to technology and innovation and new values, in other words, they need to be involved in all the activities, and especially from a human standpoint. And let me clarify something here. Generally, when we talk about competitiveness and productivity, etc., we were always speaking about the shareholder value. But today, we need to think 
about the integral value for all stakeholders, not only the owners of the companies, whether they're public or private, but also the workers, the employees, their suppliers, etc. We need to create the right conditions to attract young people, to incorporate them into all of these chains in which we participate and have discussions. We want them to be factors and to share new ideas with us. A last comment. A Mexican philosopher, Cantiflas, spoke about financing. So let me speak briefly about financing. Everything we want to do in the future will have to be financed. And as Cantinflas said, well, that's where the problem lies. Give me, let me give you a, a figure. Total savings in Latin America is now 15% of GDP, about $600 billion. Investment needs in order to grow to 4 or 5% is approximately an additional 10%, 1,300, 1,400. Where will we get from this from? Well, that's where the multilaterals come in, CAF, IDB, World Bank, et cetera, but also the high quality foreign investment, but with a different approach, focusing on young people. Thank you very much, Enrique. Let me close by thanking very specially President Langos, Enrique Iglesias, Enrique Garcia, and Donna Reinach for a fascinating Discussion. I'd like to thank you for everything Real does, my dear friend Enrique. And before we get kicked off from the Zoom platform, let me just say it has been a privilege to moderate such a valuable talk as this one. We will undoubtedly do, as the President Lago also said, we're going to think about these problems of Latin America that goes through social issues. We will invite you to an event to, to be held in September, but obviously ahead of time, we will send analyses prepared at the bank. So once again, let me thank you all for your valuable and interesting time. I think we've had more people than anticipated in Rike in Uruguay at least. So thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Pleasure seeing you, pleasure seeing all of you.